All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Others will continue to join, but we'll get a move on. All right, welcome everyone. I'm Casey McPherson, the Senior Planner in the Division of Local Government at DOLA, and we're excited to host this opportunity to discuss technical details of House Bill 241313, Transit-Oriented Communities. We have an expert group of panelists that will introduce themselves. But big picture, you can expect a presentation of the technical details of the bill for the first half and Q&A for the second half. In the chat, please submit any questions that come to mind throughout the session, and our panel will answer what's possible during the Q&A portion, and then we'll work to follow up with you as needed. And then while the focus of today is to support technical staff in potential subject jurisdictions in their preliminary calculations, I'm happy to see others are interested in this topic, so we'll remain focused in this webinar on the technical details of the bill. If you have questions outside of that, please feel free to reach out to any of us and we can work to connect you with the right person for follow-up. And then, so that I've said it already, yes, a copy of the slides will be shared. So with that, I will pass it over to John. Thanks, Casey. I'm uh, John Moore. I'm a policy advisor in the governor's office. I cover uh, transportation, land use, and environmental issues. And prior to joining the governor's office, I uh, was a city planner at City of Arvada for five years. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I know we've been uh, meeting with a handful of you uh, for the past several months. We've um, really been trying to um, discuss a lot of the technical details and, and um, dig into this with our local planning partners uh, since last fall. Um, so again, thank you everyone who has joined us um, for those. Um, next slide, please. As Casey mentioned, we're here today because we, we've heard from a lot of folks that um, there are some questions around the kind of technical implementation, um, but some of the details around how these work. So we wanted to make sure we offered this opportunity to address some of the common misconceptions uh, of the bill, provide guidance on housing opportunity goal and transit center calculation, provide hypothetical examples for HOG and TC calculations, and then discuss um, any technical questions at the end. Um, as I mentioned, we've been uh, meeting with folks really since late summer, um, early fall to kind of develop a lot of these ideas um, and, and dig into how different communities um, work on these. Um, we've looked at, uh, several of us have, have worked in local communities. We've also discussed um, details with our local planning partners um, to really dig into, to see how this will work best. Um, and then make sure that there is flexibility um, for each community to um, work through menus of options and, and work with the incentives in the bill. Um, and just to reiterate, we really um, want to make sure that we're focusing on the technical kind of details of, of the bill um, and ideas that we've been working through have certainly appreciated the feedback that we've received and, and um, uh, detailed comments we've received from local folks and um, welcome future technical input like that. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Nathan to walk you through the rest of the presentation. Good morning, everybody. Nathan Lindquist. I'm a senior land use planner at CDOT and uh, work with the land use team on the details of the bill. First, just wanted to go over some of the big picture uh, goals of the transit oriented communities bill. Overarching, we wanted to have the bill be about really the state setting a higher level target and then with a lot of flexibility for local jurisdictions to figure out how to reach it. Uh, and then the overall goals are reducing zoning as an initial barrier to housing, knowing that zoning is never the only barrier to housing um, to solve the overall goals that we have as a state, but is, a, is an initial barrier there that can lead to more housing production. But we know that also there's barriers such as infrastructure and other ones. So if we can then accelerate housing production through financial assistance to cities and counties, and then also help residents stay in their communities as we can do that. And the bill, of course, is applying to about 30 jurisdictions within MPO areas, basically on the I-25 corridor from Fort Collins to um, Colorado Springs and the Denver Metro in between. Next slide. So at a high level, what the TOC bill does is establish housing opportunity goals, and that will seek to increase the number of homes that can be built near transit and city centers. The goal of what 
the bill is trying to get to as far as a target is to for that housing opportunity goal is to um, make allow for more housing to be affordable and then more ridership for transit. So the goal is really oriented around thinking through what are the zoning levels needed to achieve those things. And so with those housing opportunity goals, then uh, there's new funding sources and there's many pathways to meet that target. And some of those examples of that in the bill is an affordable housing tax credit for $30 million that will be in these areas. And then also a transit oriented communities infrastructure fund at a level of $35 million that would help local governments fund the infrastructure needs, which are also critical to um, pairing with the zoning to create more housing. Next slide. So just to walk through a couple of things um, that we've just heard along the journey from folks and wanted to make clear the differences, particularly between um, SB 213 last year and HB 13, 13 this year. And one of those is that the housing opportunity goal calculation is much different. And this shows a graphic just to kind of explain that the transit centers are where the zoning um, is, the dense zoning is placed, whereas the transit areas are the areas near transit routes and stations. But we wanted to clarify, especially that not every transit area has to have a transit center. And that's the flexibility in the bill to, to pick and choose what areas make sense um, for local governments to have density. Next slide. A, a second common misconception we've seen is kind of the difference between zoning capacity and housing production. Of course, with Proposition 123, a lot of local governments have been focused on housing production as that is the, the, the goal and the target uh, in Prop 123. But with HB 1313, the goal is really about having enough zoning in place as an opportunity for the housing, but there is no penalties or other uh, downsides if the housing doesn't occur because, of course, that is something that various affordable housing providers or uh, market providers are usually the ones working on that and isn't fully in the control of local governments. So we really wanted to focus on zoning capacity with this bill as, as, a, as a goal. Next slide. Another th thought we've heard is the, the, the state would be at a level of dictating zone, zoning districts and saying exactly what the zoning needs to be, and that that takes input away from local governments and from the community members in those areas. And so we wanted to talk about that a little bit, just to say that zone districts, for the most part, are still, the details are decided locally. And just like any other planning effort where there's a larger look at rezoning, there would be, we would imagine, a lot of public hearings and community engagement in that process. Um, and then there would still be voting on what are the rezonings and a lot of discussion around different options to do uh, density and having visioning exercises and all of those things. So the hope is that that while the goal set, the, the bill does set targets and goals, there's so many different ways to meet those goals in different locations that public input on that is still a critical part of it. Next slide. Another one we wanted to touch on really quickly was cities will be required to permit housing even if infrastructure is not available. And we wanna make sure that it's clear that jurisdictions may continue to deny permits or condition approvals of housing units based on whether the project can meet standards for infrastructure, whether that's water, sewer, streets, electric, or impact fees, just as they're doing now. Um, and we'll be adding some clarifications in the future drafts of the bill to that just to say nothing will present jurisdictions from doing that. But in addition, there will also be some efforts to um, allow some flexibility in the bill for transit centers where infrastructure is most plentiful and available, given that that's an important part of adding, adding housing. Next slide. 
Another another thing we wanted to touch on was the POC infrastructure fund. And obviously there's only a certain amount of money there, but what we really want to clarify is that it's the start of a larger effort to unlock and align other state and federal funds. And there's always this chicken or the egg question when it comes to funding and zoning. That's an understandable um, a need for both. And how do you start it? How do you start down this path when when you have one and not the other? And so, by tackling zoning as a barrier, uh, we really are hoping it's going to enable a more systemic shift in funding to support these kind of transit rich areas. So the the communities that are uh, qualifying as transit-oriented communities. So we talked about they're in metropolitan planning organizations with a population of at least 4,000 with more than 75 acres of transit areas. And then some of the counties in these areas also qualify if they're near light or community rail stations um, and also have bus areas that are completely surrounded by municipalities. So the list on the right there is what we think are the communities that qualify by this. But of course, we're kind of working with different communities just to make sure that this list, list is correct as we go forward. Next slide. So I think at this point, I can turn it over to uh, Kelly Blinn and she will take you through more of the details of if you, as we walk through the bill, how do you calculate a housing opportunity goal? How do you determine that um, you're a transit-oriented community or not? And we can um, then take questions once we get through some of these details. Kelly, if you want to go from here. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Blinn. Um, I'm a transportation and land use policy advisor with the Colorado Energy Office, and I've been helping out uh, with the interagency team. So. Just we'll talk through kind of how the how the bill works um, from a, a technical perspective, and then then we can move to questions. Um, so first of all, key key part of calculating the housing opportunity goal um, is identifying kind of which transit services qualify. Um, and if you've looked at the bill, Section two hundred eight uh, defines the applicable transit routes. This is a a little bit focused on the Denver Boulder Metro, we can uh, answer questions about Colorado Springs and Fort Collins um, as needed as well. Um, but for the, the Denver Boulder area, um, the bill defines the, the routes that qualify based on what's in the RTD system optimization plan um, with routes that have planned uh, 15 minute frequency or better, um, as well as those bus rapid transit routes that are in Dr. Cog's uh, long range transportation plan that are planned for implementation by 2030. Um, and uh, section 208 of the bill establishes that the agencies would publish an official map of these areas just to clear up any misconceptions. But this was something we wanted to go over as we wanna make sure any local jurisdictions, you know, aren't including 15 minute bus routes um, that say currently have 15 minute service, but not that's not the case um, in the RTD system optimization plan. And then similarly, if there are planned BRT routes that are not in the long range transportation plan um, or planned for after 2030. Um, so we are always happy to, to meet with jurisdictions if you have questions about this. This is sort of a high level map of the routes that, that qualify. Um, and again, yeah, happy to, to follow up if there are specific questions, but those are the, the basic plans that, that qualify. Um, and then this is for Colorado Springs and Fort Collins in Colorado Springs. Um, this is just based on existing service um, because there kind of isn't one of those, those future transit agency plans. And then in Fort Collins, this is based on um, their, their transit master plan. So continuing on with how to calculate the, the housing opportunity goal, we've mentioned a few times the, the concept of exempt parcels. These areas are subtracted out of uh, the eligible transit areas um, and are generally parcels that are you know, not easily developable or not controlled by local governments as is the, is the case uh, with, with something like federal property. So this is the current list, uh, including things like uh, industrial zoning or use, um, 
parts of parcels that are in a floodway or a hundred year floodplain. Uh, we know there's a few cemeteries close to transit, et cetera. Um, so these areas get subtracted out um, of, of the transit area uh, before calculating the housing opportunity goal. Identifying the transit areas in your jurisdiction, um, there's, there's sort of two, two types defined in the bill. Uh, first, there's transit corridor areas, um, and this is a quarter mile around both those frequent bus corridors uh, that I mentioned that have 15 minute or better service, um, as well as bus rapid transit corridors that run on surface streets, um, such as the, the planned Colfax corridor. Um, then we also have transit station areas. Uh, these are a half mile around light and commuter rail stations, um, as well as around commuter bus rapid transit stations. Commuter bus rapid transit are, are those that run on limited access highways like the Flatiron Flyer. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, there would be an official map published just to clear up any, any kind of misconceptions around uh, which transit might qualify. Um, but this is how you define the transit areas in your jurisdiction. So we talked a little bit about the transit services that qualify. Um, and now we want to sort of talk about the different uh, pieces of the HOG formula. Um, and this slide sort of puts that together. So first you take your eligible transit area acreage. Uh, that means all the acres within transit areas minus the area of those exempt parcels. Then multiply that by a net housing density of 40 units per acre. Um, and that equals your housing opportunity goal. And I won't go into a lot of detail here, um, but we did arrive at that 40 units per acre in part due to research indicating what density levels are sufficient to support transit ridership, um, as well as uh, densities needed to cost effectively deliver affordable housing. So those are sort of the, the two goals we are trying to reach there. <clears throat> so now you've, that you've calculated the HOG, it's time to talk through how you meet the HOG, um, that's by designating enough transit centers so that collectively there's enough zoning capacity in those areas to add up uh, to at least the housing opportunity goal. Many communities will already have zoning districts in transit areas that meet the criteria to be designated as transit centers or are close. Um, and so we, we sort of recommend to start by assessing the zoning capacity in those districts. Uh, the bill does define what criteria uh, needs to be in place to designate um, a district as a transit center. That includes allowing a minimum net housing density of 15 units per acre, allowing administrative approval of projects that are less than five acres, um, and a determination of how much density that district allows accounting for dimensional standards like setbacks, lot coverage, parking, etc. cetera. Um, and the state would provide both guidance and a calculation model to be able to help calculate that, that net housing density. Um, in terms of some of the flexibility that we want to be sure to, to clarify um, in designating transit centers, uh, mixed use areas that allow residential can count. Um, residential zones with existing housing can also count. Um, there's also built in or automatic flexibility to extend outside of transit areas up to a quarter mile from the edge of transit areas, um, as long as that district is at least partially uh, within the transit area. Um, and then there's additional flexibility to go above and beyond um, that there's some, some criteria in the bill that we're continuing to workshop, but if there are you know, other transit services planned um, or you know, areas that, that your jurisdiction is trying to, to plan for a walkable kind of mixed use area, those are the types of areas that would be given consideration for, for more flexibility on location. As I mentioned, to meet the HOG, um, you'll need to identify enough transit centers so that the total capacity of all the transit centers adds up to at least the HOG. There are a lot of different options to get there, um, and transit centers can be a lot of different densities, sizes, and shapes. Um, and so these are just some of the different examples of how communities can adjust their zoning to meet the HOG, including things like um, allowing increased building height, allowing housing in more areas, addressing other standards in your code that might limit uh, net housing density like setbacks or lot coverage. Uh, in single family areas, you could allow incremental additional density uh, like triplexes to get to that 15 dwelling units per acre. 
Uh, you could allow housing um, in zones that are cur currently commercial only um, or light industrial. Um, and as we mentioned, there's also the potential to look outside the transit areas to some degree. One of the sort of additional misconceptions that we've heard that we just want to clear up um, is that all transit areas um, would have to be transit centers. And in that case, have to be at least 15 dwelling units per acre. Um, this, it doesn't actually mean um, that, you know, you can leave some transit areas without a transit center. Um, and in that case, kind of leave some single family zones aside, um, if that's the approach that you would want to take. Um, it's just that in order to, for areas to be counted as transit centers and to count towards the HOG, uh, they have to be zoned to allow for at least 15 dwelling units per acre. And just wanted to mention too that kind of per standard zoning practice, uh, projects can also be permitted at lower density levels than 15 dwelling units per acre. Just to wrap up, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of how different uh, fictional communities can meet their HOD. Uh, so in this example, we have Broncosville. Uh, this community has one frequent bus route and one light rail station. Um, and collectively, after subtracting the area of exempt parcels, their HOG is 30,000. So in this, these images, the light blue buffers are the transit areas, and then the hashed lines are the transit centers, um, or in this case, our existing zoning districts that already meet the criteria to be designated as transit centers. So in the pre-amended bill, this kind of has the, the page and line number if you're interested, um, transit centers can extend outside of, of transit areas. Um, as I mentioned, automatically they can extend an additional quarter mile beyond the edge of the transit area if it's contiguous. Um, and additionally, if the area meets some, some other criteria, more locational flexibility can be approved beyond the quarter mile. So that in this case, Broncosville could count its additional zoning capacity that meets the criteria to be a transit center, but may be located a bit further away, um, sort of as long as it, it still meets uh, the intent of the, of the bill. Next, we have Avsville, uh, which is a city with dense zoning around one transit station <clears throat> and only needs a bit of additional zoning capacity to meet their HOG. Their HOG is 6,000 um, and they have an existing zoning district in just one of their, their transit areas uh, that already enable zoning capacity for 5,000 units. So they just need zoning capacity that would enable 1,000 additional units. And this just shows that. So Asheville has a couple options. Uh, one option is that they can increase their height or other dimensional standards in their existing transit center to allow even more zoning capacity and leaves the rest of the, their transit area as is that might be, say, all single family today. Finally, we have Nuggetsville, which is a suburban city. Um, and there are a few strategies they could combine to meet, meet the HOG. Um, in this case, as we've illustrated here, that includes one, enabling mixed use and multifamily zoning along the transit corridor up to three stories. Um, and with lower parking ratios and other dimensional standards, that can actually yield a net density of around 80 dwelling units per acre or even more in some cases. Um, so that, that could be one strategy. And then in addition to that, um, they could also look at, in a broader area, enabling some additional density in their single family zone, say up to triplexes, um, that could reach that 15 dwelling units per acre threshold and also contribute to the HOG. So just a couple of examples for you. And with that, I will just wrap up with some next steps and then we can open it up for Q&A. Um, hopefully those are some helpful examples and, and a walkthrough. Um, the bill will next be going to the House Appropriations Committee before going to the floor and then onto the Senate. Um, we are gonna continue to hold land use practitioner drop-in sessions on Fridays at 10 a.m. Um, if you're not, on that invite yet, please reach out to us and we're happy to add you. Um, and as always, you know, happy to meet one on one with with your staff, um, clear up any questions. So please reach out to us. These are all of our emails here. And thanks so much. I will pass it over to Casey for questions. Kelly, one's already going in the chat. So now we will start Q&A portion. 
Um, so we may jump around a bit, uh, so please uh, bear with us. The first 